Welcome, um, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this virtual gathering and the third roundtable as part of the Bugs and Beasts Colloquium, where we are asking the question, what is the human anyway? Uh, my name is Nina Bozichnik, and I'm a curator at the Henry Art Gallery at the University of Washington in Seattle. And together with my colleagues, Mita Mahato, Associate Curator of Public and Youth Programs, and Carolyn Pinedo Ternofsky, Associate Professor of American Ethnic Studies, we organized the present colloquium taking inspiration from the 2019 film Bugs and Beasts Before the Law by the artist collaboration Bam Bitchell. We conceived of the colloquium as an interdisciplinary forum to explore uh, themes of the film, including the way socio-legal systems mediate and oppress personhood, as well as a space to imagine possibilities for collective liberation. Um, please visit the colloquium um, microsite, and we'll go ahead and put a link in the chat box um, so that you can see a full listing of the events related to the colloquium and access uh, the written contributions from all of today's um, contributors, as well as um, previous roundtable discussions. Um, as you know, it's important that we do a land acknowledgement, and we've instituted this as a practice at the Henry a few years ago. The land acknowledgement is an opportunity for us to acknowledge that we at the Henry and the University of Washington live and work on the unceded ancestral lands of the Coast Salish peoples and the shared waters of all tribes and bands, named and unnamed, including the Squamish, Duwamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. The land acknowledgement reminds us of our connections and indebtedness to the peoples and the more than human kin where we live and work. And we pay respects to elders past and present. The Bugs and Bees Colloquium is supported by the Simpson Center for the Humanities. And we want to thank Kathleen Woodward, Rachel Artiega, Caitlin Palo, and the whole Simpson Center staff for their support. And a shout out today to Danielle Stevens, who is providing today's live captioning. Um, thank you, Danielle. And my colleague at the Henry, Ian Sipuran, um, for all the behind the scenes organizing for this gathering. As I mentioned, the colloquium takes the name and takes its name and inspiration from the experimental essay film by Ben Bitchell, the artistic collaboration of Alexis Kyle Mitchell and Charlene Bambit. The film, which will be on view at the Henry in early 2021, explores the history and legacy of the animal trials that took place across medieval and early modern Europe and its colonies in the Americas, in which non-human animals and inanimate objects were put on trial for various crimes and offenses ranging from trespassing and thievery to assault and murder. Ben Mitchell's film animates how power is performed through the body of the other, revealing the ways authorities and institutions mediate social relations and subjecthood. And it explores the absurd origins of legal practice and its capricious machinations that survive today. Um, we're happy to have Alexis and Charlene here with us as attendees uh, today's roundtable. And if you have any questions for them or for any of our panelists, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, box at any time throughout the program. We won't have a formal Q&A today, um, but the panelists um, will do their best to um, address your questions as, um, as we go. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our guest. Um, there is much to say about all of our esteemed contributors, but in the interest of time, I'm going to keep it brief. And so I encourage you to please visit the colloquium microsite again uh, for full bios in there. Ian put, um, put the link in the chat. Thank you, Ian. Um, Today's topic is going to be introduced by Dr. Colin Diane. Um, Dr. Diane is the Robert Penn Warren Professor in the Humanities at Vanderbilt University and Professor of Law. Her acclaimed books include Haiti History and the Gods, The Law is a White Dog, How Legal Rituals Make and Unmake Persons, The Story of Cruel and Unusual, and recently In the Belly of Her Ghost. Her articles on prisons, torture, dogs in the South have appeared in the Yale Review, Southwest Review, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Boston Review, and the London Review of Books. And her forthcoming book, Animal Quintet, a Southern memoir, is set for release next week, and we're all eager to, to read it. 
Um, Professor Diane is joined today by members of our University of Washington community, Philip Thurtle, Professor of History and Chair of the Comparative History of Ideas Department, Radhika Govindrajan, Associate Professor of Anthropology, and Joanne Wuk, a lecturer in the Disability Studies Program. Um, Radhika is in India, um, so we won't have her video on um, for today. Uh, we'll just be hearing her um, through, through, our, through our devices, um, but she's present and participating. So um, just a note about why you're not seeing her on the, on the screen. Um, we'd like to thank all of our esteemed panelists for taking um, time sharing this conversation with us and sharing their insights in this virtual format. So please join me in a virtual applause as we welcome um, our guests. Go ahead, Colin. Okay, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I did want to just say that Animal Quintet is out, it's here. It came out and arrived yesterday. So um, it has and it contains um, a great deal of my thoughts uh, about the non-human, although I really do think we want to get away from as many people have argued, this division, this usage of human and non-human as a binary. So what I want to do, I'm hoping we'll have a conversation um, about that, but I want to begin with two stories that are in a sense uh, eulogies to two beings. I'm beginning with Stella, my American Staffordshire Terrier. Early one morning, I walked Stella down the main street of my Nashville neighborhood. She's a black American Staffordshire Terrier with front paws of white fur and a tail that has always been crooked. A man in a pickup truck was waiting in a drive. She ran up to him as she sometimes does when white men in trucks, those I grew up knowing as crackers or rednecks look out at her. She jumped one paw in the man's seat and another on his leg and began to greet him with licks, sniffs, and nudges. He welcomed her as I looked on in wonder. Then he explained, she knows I'm sick and that's why she's trying to help me. I'm dying. Then he gently beat his chest, adding, she can smell it. She wants to give me some relief. By watching Stella, I learned to know feeling that is nothing other than knowing, an exhilaration that braces the mind. This knowing has nothing to do with our assumptions and everything to do with ways of seeing. It demands an attentiveness that summons another way of being in the world. What would it mean politically and socially to reorient our ethical, and conceptual assumptions by taking on the perspective of dogs or other critters. Remaining in touch with the matter of daily life, we too might begin to travel across entities and into other bodies. For me, the condition of being dog is not the precondition for uniqueness, but rather an imperative to seek a more voracious if always provisional communion. And the other opening is for Nasser Hussein, who died two years ago unexpectedly. Nasser was a brilliant historian and anthropologist who taught at Amherst. One night we were after a conference sitting on a patio talking about how one could within the ac academy refang thought. And it was late, it was past midnight, and we began to talk about sacrifice, which both of us had an interest in since Nasser had watched throughout his upbringing, the sacrifice of chickens, 
and goat, I'm sorry, the yearly goat sacrifice in Pakistan. And I, when living in Haiti and working on Rudu, became very familiar with the sacrifice of chickens. There was a story in Haiti about the smile on the chickens' faces. There was a legend, there was a story that animals showed their willingness to be slaughtered and only then would they be killed. It's a very uncomfortable discussion to bring up. However, one of the things I hope to open with is this possibility of finding a world that is not supernatural in the way we understand it, and that isn't transcendent in the way that we were taught to think the higher things are. Rather, it was, it's, it's a world that really is trying to think about the natural or the supernatural, something that is so living and visceral that we are invited into its precincts, even if we feel we want to turn the other way. Um, for me, this brings us into the question of the sacred and the meaning of accursed objects. And let me end by saying that the work that I have been doing over the last few years responds to the question about sensation, whether or not the senses can demand to be present in such a way that they set the terms for how we talk about creaturely experience. For me, that would mean to ups that would be upsetting the reasonable, disturbing consensus, and most of all, the reasonable, which has always, it seems to me, um, masked a certain kind of mean and, and monopolizing legitimacy. So let me just say then that I hope today we will all share together the approach to ways of knowing that can shove us into the gap of not knowing, to be cracked by the pain of life, to be constantly recruited into a world of wonder so that we can take our attention away from the habits of the human and the perception of the human. Thank you again for inviting me and I'm delighted to open our conversation today. So um, who would like to begin? Radhika? Thank you, Colin. Um, that was really wonderful and provocative. And we did end this, but you couldn't have set the tone better for my comments, which are about sacrifice based on my fieldwork in uh, the central Himalayan region of India. So the piece I contributed was an excerpt from a chapter in my book that looks at some of the ethical dilemmas that are around animal sacrifice. And I want to think today about how that question of what the human is anyway comes up in the context of ritual Hindu sacrifice in the Himalayan region. Um, so the story of sacrifice and the story of how animals came to be sacrificed goes something like this. At some point in the past, it was humans who were sacrificed to the gods. Um, and it was always sons who were sacrificed. And this one woman who had only one son begged the goddess to accept something else in a place for her son. And she said, I will give you something that I love and something that causes me pain. And the goddess said, yes, but it must be a sacrifice. And that is the story of how um, animals were substituted for the original human sacrifice. But the human in that original story was a sacrificial beast. And that is what the human is anyway, a sacrificial beast, much like other sacrificial beasts. Um, the 
contemporary practices of sacrifice rely on uh, exactly the form of consent that Colin was just talking about, the idea that you cannot sacrifice an animal without its consent. And there are certain mechanisms for consent. Um, but one of the things that happens before the animal is asked for his consent, it's usually goats in the region that I worked in, male goats, um, that the animal is inducted into the family lineage before it can be sacrificed. It must take the place of a son. So the, the idea of what the human and what the animal is, is already muddled in that moment. Um, the question of, in this case, uh, one, of the, the, one of the moments that the book opens with is this debate uh, in a family where the visiting nephew of this family that had sacrificed um, eight goats for a ritual. What kind of practice is this anyway? It's, it's incredibly barbaric and it's false because if you did really want to give something you love to the gods, you would offer children. You know, this, this whole argument that you love animals and you're offering something that causes you pain is specious because you're not actually offering something that causes you pain. Um, and that argument suggests that a human ultimately is one that can't be sacrificed, that the human depends on animal abjection. And in my work, I've tried to think against that or try and think through the arguments that people make against that. And one of the arguments that I make in the book is that sacrifice, what makes sacrifice meaningful, allows animals to consent, is love, is care, is the care labor performed by rural women who raise the animals that are then sacrificed. And I describe how this labor is grueling and routinized, but produces these affective relationships between women and the animals that then eventually die for them and their families. And I suggest that as a counter to the abjection that some people see in the practice, there are new paradigms of relationality that are rooted in care labor. There are practices of repair, to quote from the anthropologist Deborah Thomas, that are rooted in a deep recognition of human complicity. That what we see there is precisely what Colin was just talking about, the gap of not knowing of what constitutes the most ethical relationship. So I have tried to think about that question of what the human is as a work in progress, as something that is open, as something that is uncertain, and something that begins from a recognition of complicity. Um, let me very briefly talk about the law, because one of the ways in which this question is mediated is through the law. So the practice of animal sacrifice has been incredibly contentious in the past decade, and several animal rights groups have tried to um, have the practice banned, and high courts and Supreme Courts in India have stepped in to legislate in this question. So the high court in the region that I worked in um, suggested that animals could not be sacrificed for religious purposes. They could be sacrificed for food, but not for religion. And I found that that uh, refusal of the shared section of humans and animals was really interesting, that this was an attempt to bypass the laws of the gods, if you will, and put in place the law of the secular state. So the question is also which law and whose law are we talking about? But I also want to think about um, the dangers of using the law to establish um, boundaries around what constitutes properly human activity. So one of the ways in which the law has been invoked is to uh, set the, the terms of what it means to be human and what it means to be a modern human, which is not to engage in violence against the animal. But in a context like India, which is currently um, under a, a Hindu fascist government, what you see is the weaponization of the law then to animalize Muslims, Dalits, Adivasis, other religious minorities that are seen as being, um, that are seen as not fitting within the category of the human. So I also want us to, to trouble the idea that the law might be um, a way to achieve um, to more ethical and more just relationships and come back to where Colin left us, which is what it might mean to, again, stay in this gap of not knowing and to seek a path out through recognition of complicity. I'll stop there. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Radhika, I'm so uh, struck, I have to say, um, by your work. And one of the things I'd like to push you on that I was, it's the most beautiful description. I mean, I use the word beauty with great force um, about the relatedness in the dog leopard uh, reciprocity, which is the dog leopard engaging in um, the dogs being eaten by the leopard. 
you ask a question about the violence and you say, this is their relation and who am I to break it? This was mm -hmm. not senseless violence, nor was it born of a simple animal instinct. This was the violence at the heart of relatedness, the expected outcome of a difficult yet inevitable entangling of lives and faith. And then you begin to have a kind of discourse on love. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the love that you portray here? Because you have refanged the experience of love in the most powerful way. Could you speak a little bit more about um, that mutuality of adaptation that takes place in, uh, I don't even know if the word devouring would be right, but in the meat of the dog and the leopard. Yeah, thank you, Colin. That's a, that's a really beautiful question. I like to think of this through the Australian philosopher Val Plumwood, who talks about the difference between a kind of regenerative death and a reform death. And I and I struggled initially with thinking about how this might be the natural outcome of the relationship between leopards and dogs and what it might mean for dogs to know that this is the only form of relate they can expect. But I think thinking about what it means to to regenerate another within that cycle and what that form of love might be was one way in which I um, have been working through this. But more generally, I'm, I'm starting to think of love as a form of labor and of different kinds of love uh, entailing different forms of labor and wondering if we might think of love's politics but all the effects on the world through the certain kinds of labor. So if dogs are laboring to keep leopards alive, then what form of love? Is that a form of love? So I don't know if I have a question or if I have a response to your question. I've been wondering, do dogs love leopards if they're laboring to keep them alive? Um, and what, what might it look like to think of that? Because I think there have been uh, moments where we talked about dogs giving themselves up for hungry leopards and recognizing that leopards fulfill their own role in this kind of social ecosystem. So what might it may mean to suspend judgment for a moment, as you said, and step into that space of wonder and imagine for a second that that might be love as sustenance? Thank you. And I was asking because um, one of the really painful things to write when I was writing Animal Quintet was um, the business of sacrifice, or maybe this is not the mm -hmm. right, but my parents, my father was a photographer. And after they died, um, the photos stayed in these boxes. Uh, I uncovered photographs of the bullfights that they went to on their honeymoon. And maybe this fores foresaw the doom that would be their marriage. <laughs> I, he took her to the bullfights in Mexico. Um, as she was 17 years younger, and um, there began their marriage. But one of the things that they say about, I, I read a lot about bullfights, which to me is the ho mo most horrific, uh, cruel um, encounter between human and animal. And yet, if you speak with the matador, or those, the picador that were most involved in the death and killing of the bull, they will tell you this is a love affair. So people apply the terminology of mm -hmm. love in these places that are really intense, right? It's almost mm -hmm. as if in the longing for uh, an encounter with the non-human. Um, mm -hmm. Humans can only see it through a certain kind of bloodletting. Um, and yet, again, um, the question is how one engages, it seems to me, um, in that ritual killing, which I think uh, bullfight is. And the only way I could do it was to think through um, the bull, think through its body, its dying it's silent death in, from those photos. But I do think mm -hmm. it's a place where um, 
we all maybe want to talk about the nature of sacrifice because um, I remember there was a big talk about law, big legal case in California years ago um, to outlaw the sacrifices of chickens that were part of ritual, santeria. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a great debate about that because it was an imposition of the law onto the rights of people, you know, rights unintended of people. And so um, Stéphane Palmier, the anthropologist, got very engaged uh, in trying to argue for uh, the um, meaning of a sacrifice as not always killing. And so I, I think that sacrifice is the place where we we need to uh, kind of rest or stay for just a little while because, um, you know, it's, it's a paradoxical place, right? Uh, it's radically material, but um, I think it's an encounter that we have real difficulty uh, with uh, because of the animal rights activism that names it cruel. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm interested in how we deal with uh, the notion of cruelty, uh, the work I did on pit bulls um, and with dogs at the edge of life, you know, pit bulls would be killed by uh, PETA and other animal rights organizations because they claimed they were fighting dogs. There was no proof allowed. But in the field work I did, many people lost, many breeders lost their American, their Staffordshire Terriers uh, to the Humane Society without um, a case uh, within 24 hours. So I, I think within our own world, um, we face the very, very difficult and discomforting uh, situation of judging uh, people who have uh, rituals or activities that are not in line with what we want to see. And that is the fact of um, the dog fight, which is a horrific. You know, I, uh, this is not uh, this is not to make it an exception for dog fights. It's to raise the issue of questions of affect and attentiveness. Mm -hmm. of people who are not in our crowd, so to speak, people we would not typically necessarily hang out with who have different relationships with the non-human or with the animals than we do. So um, again, you know, I just wanted to, in this forum to raise, uh, it's, it's rare that you're in a forum where you would raise, uh, you could raise that difficult, difficult question um, about the status, um, you know, who gets to claim status? you know, um, the human status. What is, does it mean to be humane? Um, and I guess in all my work, uh, let me just leave it here. I'm trying to reach, and I think Radhika's work is heading us there. I hope some of what I've done also tries to put us into the question mark. What does it mean for us to live um, in a political climate? that makes us acquiescent in multiple genocides. I mean, I think in the end, for both Radhika and for me, these questions about sacrifice, about animals, are deeply questions about our own political enterprise and the varying subjections that it entails. So um, I think it's important to know that this is something I think we are really facing now in our country. Uh, you know. Thanks, Colin. These are such important questions. I think uh, I was just going to put another thing out there. I know Nina wants us to segue to Joanne's work. I think those questions are so important. And one of the 
it, it gets me thinking about whether we can actually think past a um, secular point of view to also understand other kinds of divorces as mediators in this question and what would it mean to also take seriously. But I think that's something we'll say for later because um, I do know that we have to get to Joanne. Mm -hmm. Hi, this is Joanne. <laughs> I wanted to, as we segue, um, thank all the panelists that I got to read your amazing work. I look forward to continuing this discussion. Thank you to the Henry Gallery folks for organizing us and especially thank you to Van Bitchell for this so thought provoking film. Um, I approached the, the panel and the question from the broad perspective of disability studies and the broad question of the relationship between disability and animality, the relationships between ableism and speciesism, and can there be anti-ableist approaches to animal ethics? And from, from my background on this, um, I think a main touch point for the disability studies scholarship and disability communities on this issue of the relationship of animality and disability and how that can pertain to um, as Colin and all have been speaking of, of challenging what it is to be human, questioning that binary of human and animal. I think a main touch point has been the work of philosopher Peter Singer that the disability activists have been reacting against for decades in which Singer very much leveraged ableism in order to argue for animal rights, animal ethics in which um, Singer said that one of the reasons that there should be rights for animals is that some animals have capacities, in particular capacities around um, something called cognitive, intellectual, sense of the, of, the, of the future, of your future, something like that, that some people with disabilities don't necessarily have the sort of ableist view of disability. And Singer then also pursued this um, as the disability scholars and disability activists have been saying, he, pers he pursues this to say that therefore there is um, in a sense a right to destroy the lives of disabled infants who will not have what are perceived as fully human capacities and who do not fully qualify for personhood that some animals more qualify for personhood <clears throat> um, in various senses than humans do. So to sort of pit disability against animals has been a lot of what has framed the scholarship and the, and the thinking around this. And I was really struck, I, I often teach the piece by the late lawyer disability activist Harriet McBride Johnson and I was really struck by her passage. She you know, had an had a infamous meeting with Peter Singer. She went and talked on a panel with him at a university and then she wrote about it in the New York Times which really called attention to this a couple decades ago, I think. And she notes, um, quote, because I am still seeking acceptance of my humanity, Singer's call to get past species seems a luxury way beyond my reach. So this, and I also uh, drew upon some of the work from a couple decades ago by another disability justice activist, Eli Clare, who um, called out, you know, that for him, the use of the word freak, as opposed to sort of in disability community, disability studies, the claiming of crip or cripple or um, that sort of language. He couldn't reclaim freak because of the connection to the freak show, right? And the violences of the freak show for um, marginalized people and multiple, multiply marginalized people, people of color, black people who were displayed in the freak show, people with intellectual disabilities who were displayed in freak show and people who maybe had um, intersecting identities across those who really had little to no agency which in, within that system, whereas there's been a disability studies scholarship about how the freak show historically was actually a place where some disabled folks could have agency and could find employment and make choices and develop their own performances. But for some folks that wasn't so. And Claire really draws upon this concept and the, the utilization there of the missing link, right? That 
uh, black people and intellectually disabled people were seen as the link between animality and humanity. And therefore this was, in, for, for Claire, this is too dangerous in a sense, right? It's too much of a risk for some of these disability activists to try to break away from the binary of the human and the animal. So this, this is an emerging, I think it's an emerging uh, scholarship to find ways to um, support animal rights, animal activism, non-human animals um, in a way that doesn't leverage negative qualities of disability uh, in order to do that. And of course, disability and other minoritized categories have been leveraged, used in that way historically, um, certainly in American history, right? To say that black people are sort of categorically have these traits that are associated with disability as a way to uh, deny the rights and citizenship, citizenship, citizenship claims of black people. This, this is sort of this overarching paradigm that some of this debate has been framed in. Um, so there are, there are now some scholars and activists um, who are working towards ways to think more about breaking down this hierarchy, such as Mel Chen and their idea of animacy theory, uh, or um, Sonora Taylor, Sonny Taylor, um, asking new questions about, and she came into disability activism actually as a as a vegan activist, right? And thinking about her own disabled body and its relationships to the bodies of animals that she defines as disabled. And she's moving towards ideas of um, sort of shared experiences of dependency and vulnerability and asking questions about um, systems which only value lives, human lives, non-human lives for their productivity and the ways that that could be um, effective for thinking about human, humans as, as animals, right? And bringing together the, the, the non-human animal and the human animal worlds um, more, more seamlessly and without, again, um, either being speciesist or ableist because Taylor and others have also been calling, is all, uh, are also identifying that um, in a way uh, disability activists are now being speciesist by saying, no, we're not like animals, right? We're not non-human animals. And that's not furthering any of the, uh, any, any justice claims or movements on, on animal justice, animal rights either to do that sort of move. Um, so some of that work is happening. I think that I, I kind of offered a bit of a broad overview on it that it's still perceived as sort of a dangerous, a risky way to go. Um, but there are some ideas out there. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that for now and see what the ways that we can make connections across some of this, this work. Thank you all. Thank you so much for that. I'm thinking about Peter Singer, my God, I haven't thought about him in years, um, but he- <laughs> Lucky you, yeah. <laughs> in fact, uh, you know, his work was so troubling in so many ways, uh, the way in which, he countered um, or tried to develop a, a theory of what liberation would be. And I remember talking to him um, at, a at a panel. We happened to be on, again, it was years ago. And when I said to him that, well, he's not really speaking out of lived uh, relations with animals or with, you know, different kinds of people. Uh, I said, there's a danger in maybe theorizing about these things without having actual encounters. And he had this comeback. I said, um, he said, I don't have a dog. I don't like dogs. I don't like, you know, I'm not into the, I'm not into animals. You know, he didn't, he didn't want to make it kind of real, experiential, something that you held or touch. I mean, and it was that distancing that I thought was very interesting. It was a kind of dislocation, um, a, a, you know, a remoteness from uh, the encounter that he was des describing, which was always, you know, there was, a, there was always a divide. There was always something kind of theoretical, a thought, a way of thought that would be better than, because it was not. This, it was not tactile. It was not, you know, it was, it did not have feeling. To me, that was so suspect and so unnerving. Um, 
and I guess that's something that we've been skirting around and talking about too, is the notion of feeling what it means you know, to feel, uh, um, which I, I think um, you certainly, Joanna, uh, have um, brought us back to Singer and the harm uh, that, you know, that was done um, because he couldn't have that experience that, that there was no, to use Laurie Groon's terms, <laughs> there was no empathetic entanglement <laughs> in his work or any possibility of it. Thank you, Colin. This is Joanne. Just briefly, you're kind of reminding me of Harriet McBride's Johnson, Johnson's reaction because she goes and meets him in person, right, at this conference. And she, she has that same sense of, well, he doesn't know any disabled folks, right? He doesn't actually have any feeling for it. He doesn't have any experience and he, he's not going to have any empathy. But then she, she ends up writing about how, you know, pleasant he was. You know, of course, it was a scholarly interaction, but also that he did very um, tactile things like he actually helped to move her hand at one point, right, because it had slipped off of the arm of her wheelchair. And she actually thought, well, okay, he does actually get that I have a body uh, and my embodiment is valuable and he can interact with it. And then she ended up um, you know, exchanging correspondence with him and saying to her colleagues that he actually, you know, was <laughs> in a sense not the not the evil force that he that his theory presented him as, right? That he actually could have empathy and feelings and connection to you, but he simply he didn't really think about that and he didn't seek out disabled people. But that's also part of what disability studies says, right? That disability is so deliberately hidden away that we have made these political choices, social political choices to, to institutionalize, to say, you know, disabled people do not belong in the workplace, all that kind of thing, that we, we lack that connection. Well, I guess it's, I guess it's my turn. Um, I'm Philip, and uh, I would like to also thank uh, Ian and Nina for bringing us together and Mita for actually giving me a really warm welcome into one of the warmest welcomes into panels and projects that I've ever received. I think uh, I really appreciate that. And I also wanna send a special shout out uh, to a collaborator of mine that who's helped me develop ideas. And this is um, the, the artist uh, Dakota Gearhart. So <clears throat> in my recent work, I've been exploring um, the political and aesthetics of forms and types of interactions they promote between living and non-living things. I do this by analyzing popular and scientific uh, depictions of life, especially focusing on the role of dissensus, disagreement, and dissimilarity on what it means to be an organism. The short piece I wrote for the symposium is part of a larger project called Goth Biology. This project seeks to correct an overemphasis on the role of goal-directed outcomes in biological narratives. Goth biology sees cells, organisms, bodies, and populations as complicated composites. And the word composite here, I draw from the techniques of animation and in my article, I point to how those are used actually in Van Bichel's uh, great film. Uh, complicated composites piece together from parts that don't always fit together and often literally pull bodies in different directions. My goal is to write scientifically robust but imaginative stories about bodies that eschew the usual success stories told by scientists in order to create a gothic literature of shadows that highlight tension and loss, as well as the role of organic creativity. In my short piece, I argue that bodies are complex composites with different ways of inhabiting the world. 
I do this by highlighting the difference between what is known in evolutionary theory as, as a theory of holism versus what is known as modularity. Whole bodies are thought to subsume the parts of the body to the goals and dynamics of the whole organism. While modular bodies are thought to be built from parts and processes common to all living things. It's the fact that both of these very different ways of conceiving of bodies uh, exist at the same time that interests the goth biologist in me. When two competing ways of thinking about the body exist simultaneously, one conception haunts the other with its differences. This creates a politics of aesthetics of dissensus that I talked about earlier. We too often focus on simple cat single categories instead of recognizing how bodies haunt themselves with different potentials for inhabiting the world. Um, paying attention to these hauntings or uh, uh, the phrase that Colin and Radhika have used to step into a space of wonder allows me to identify how bodies mostly don't fit in to simple categories. This in turn allows me to tell stories of evolution and development that recognize loss, pain, and alienation in addition to the usual biological stories of successful adaptation. And importantly for our topic today, it also encourages us to explore how bodies are limited to specific conceptions of embodiment at specific historical junctures as a pragmatic function of power and as a consequence of a biology intended to serve ideological outcomes. It also cautions us about trying to find a singular concept or healing principle for all bodies at all times, but instead focus on the importance of uh, applying coping strategies to help all types of bodies and spirits endure and thrive. Thanks. Thank you. I guess I'll, I'll respond and ask you, could you say more about loss and abandonment? Yes. So uh, oh, uh, one way of telling a story in evolution is to say, okay, you fit now into this new adaptational niche. But the problem with telling that story is it doesn't tell us what we lost in order to go there. Right? And this is where the hauntings come in. For instance, um, uh, I have a story I talk about uh, on a website that I created. It's called How I Lost My Wings. Because we have the genetic and physiological capability to develop wings. But at a certain developmental moment, my abilities to create wings stopped evolutionarily. So this loss, this loss then ends up becoming uh, something that haunts us, right? It's the stories of wings and how our biology participates in that. And um, so this, that in itself is a kind of way of thinking about uh, turning, turning the evolutionary uh, story on its head. And a lot of times, it also just means focusing, and this is where the goth comes in, it just means focusing on feeling instead of trying to go to an end. Uh, and this is where uh, certain work of certain goth artists have been really inspiring to my ways of thinking about biology, where in order to process this dissensus, you can never go quickly through feeling into rationality, <laughs> right? You, you, always have to, you always have to feel 
before you can even often even construct a story and make sense of what you've been going through. So those are just some of the things I highlight in my, in my goth version of biology. I'll have to get more information and teach some of what you've written about the goth biology in my next gothic class, which is coming. <laughs> Usually gothic history and fiction, but now gothic biology. That's great. Oh, we have a big question here that Ian has just shared. Where does the industrialized slaughterhouse fit into these discussions about sacrifice? Um, and that question is from Shelby House. Um, I would love to hear what people have to think. It's uncanny. Uh, Radhika and I, I just shared um, a communication about the language of sacrifice. So, and the problem of discomfort in talking about it. And she brought up the space of the slaughterhouse, um, which also raises, as she puts it, questions about subjection, relationality and obligation. And we were just um, adding the word love as another element that has to be considered um, would, would someone begin to speak about uh, the question of the slaughterhouse? Um, this is key. And I think as a group, we should try to uh, arrive at a way of thinking through sacrifice with that very massive uh, and formalized abuse in our mind. Anyone? I'm happy to try and speak to it, maybe not directly through sacrifice. Um, Shelby, when you raised the question about the slaughterhouse, I was thinking of Alex Blanchett's book, Poor Populist, which I have been rereading recently. And I've been struck by how much he's trying to push against the idea that the slaughterhouse is an exceptional space of violence, which I think is something that we're all so used to. And he's trying to get us to think about how, what that violence actually looks like and how that violence is familiar from other kinds of spaces. And I was struck in particular by um, something he writes about, about um, this one woman whose job it is to take care of one day old piglets. She has spent her whole life in the line caring for one day old piglets and not being involved in the killing at all, but being involved in the care, knowing that you're caring for something um, that is going to be on the line. And so I wonder if we might also extend these questions about what obligation, what relationality, what subjection, what complicity look like in those spaces and think through that. So not you know, is it, is it, um, does it fit into the logic of sacrifice? I think that's an interesting question. And I always have the ethnographers cop out, which is, I would love to see what this looks like um, in particular spaces, because the slaughterhouse, say, in India is very different from slaughterhouses in the US. And so what, how do those logics of sacrifice work? What are the idioms of care? What are the idioms of violence? What are the practices of violence? I think these are questions that we have to be attentive to. And we also have to resist sort of exceptionalizing the slaughterhouse as a space of extreme violence, because I think that for, that makes us overlook other spaces of violence, but also makes us overlook what kinds of practices undergird the violence in that space. So I know that doesn't like, directly answer your question, but something that I've been thinking through. And I'll let the other panelists speak now. Thank you. Thank you. This is Joanne, um, Colin and Radhika. I, I'm thinking of a direction that maybe is too far off, but to me connects also to Bambichel's, Bambichel's wonderful film. Um, when I thought about the animal trials, um, I remembered and 
Philip, I don't know much about this, and I don't know if anybody's actually published on this. The animal trials, the bull trials, the bulls who were supposed to be sires, and this is in the 1920s, connected to the eugenics movement, right? So the USDA apparently actually put out pamphlets and publications across the US um, encouraging farmers to put on trial their bulls who were not, you know, the perfect steers, the perfect sires. And it was very much bound up with eugenic logics, um, but sort of taking eugenics and the trials of people who were to be sterilized, right? And you think about Carrie Buck and the Supreme Court case, but, you know, state by state, um, people with disabilities and, uh, and other mar marginalized identities who were supposed to be sterilized were taken in front of a hearing board and in a sense put on trial, right, in these private spaces. But then these bulls were supposed to be tried publicly as a way to encourage the uh, farmers to not use those bulls, but instead the newly engineered superior bulls, right, who would be more productive. But the farmers didn't want to put their bulls on trial and in a sense execute their bulls because they were still valuable to them, right? They were still productive within small farming, but not in the big, big agriculture setting, right? Not in industrial agriculture. And, it, and I was also reminded from the film, um, the scene with the pigs on trial that ends with the pig on the spit, right? In which the animal actually becomes viscerally useful to humans as food. And the story seems to be that the bulls who were put on trial and found guilty of not being genetically perfect enough to sire the next generation were then barbecued, right? They were still useful. So um, I don't know if that relates to sacrifice or any of this, but I was kind of halfway thinking about that. I, and I'm kind of looking at Philip if any of that resonates also. I mean, some of this legal aspect with some of those connections to eugenics. I know that's not exactly what you were talking about, but it's something that you and I have a little bit in common. Yeah, yeah, no, that was definitely, that's definitely part of, uh, still part of my work and something very important to me. Definitions of human and what is animal tend to be reflected in, and notions of causality in relationship to what is right and wrong tend to be reflected in, specific types of social orders, <laughs> right? So um, one of the reasons why the idea of sacrifice, I think, is so effective right now is because we can think about this as a return to a different type or a, 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 a moving forward to a different type of social order, right? Predicated upon intimacy in a way that we don't have. Um, and I think that, uh, and I think that's really important. And I, th and the eugenics movement there. I mean, there is a logic of sacrifice that happens throughout all of that, particularly through the in the negative eugenics movement, right? Where there's this, and that again comes from a certain type of order. It comes out of a agriculture, uh, the burgeoning industrial agricultural order and how to then bring, uh, how, to, how to then harness that. And so I love uh, the focus on sacrifice, but I'm also a little bit wondering about at what scales can we still kind of use this? And that's kind of where I've been left because I, and I don't know. I think that point about scale is so important, Philip. And um, Deborah Verdrose, uh writes about this in uh, in Dog Dreaming. I think. Sorry, it's late here. My brain is really slow. But she writes about what it means to think about different kinds of death and thinking about mass man-made death as opposed to a, a death that is more regenerative. And this is something Val Plumwood also talks about, as I said earlier. And I wonder if that's one way to think about scale. What what role does that death play? Can we think about good deaths and bad deaths um, as many people do and what, and what would that look like in different spaces? It's a way of taking up the question of scale differently, I think. Yeah, no, and I really appreciate that. And I think that's the, 
exactly the kind of refocusing it needs, right? To be thinking about, first of all, we don't, too often we don't think about death and we don't think about death as a process. We think about death as an existential switch that's flicked on and off and not as a life trajectory often for some things, for some animals and some people. And uh, we don't think about death. We tend to not carry it with us in a way. And this is actually one of the projects of goth biology is to realize that we, and we have to repersonalize that idea at some level and realize that we are carrying death with us in specific ways in how we support specific types of political economies and getting into what is a good death now I think is exactly the types of questions we need to be asking. Oh, I have a question that might relate to that. It's directed toward me, but I wanted to share it. It's from Lynn Hagen. It's a crucial question. I want to read it. Um, <clears throat> my question is for Colin Diane about the pro-life argument that abortion is sacrifice and the arguments about the fetus having a parallel status to non-human animals in terms of their capabilities agency as a justification for the taking of their life is the fetus treated as property in the same way that slaves and non-human animals are this is an excellent question and i have an admission to make when i wrote the law as a white dog people questioned you know i'm attending to the the non-personhood the negative personhood um, of slaves and of animals, and I ended uh, the book with who gets to be wanton, raising issues about the diadand, that, that object, usually an animal that is given up to God. And someone said, but what about the fetus? And this question is raised yet again is the fetus treated as property in the same way? Um, would people like to take up that question? Um, I mean, I cannot answer it, okay? Because I think that the question about abortion is a very political one, obviously, but it's also a very personal one. Most of my work uh, actually, um, to, th to think about abortion um, is a question that I wanna raise with this entire group of people here. We now have an opportunity together to think through the entity the life, the self that is the fetus. And um, I open it up for discussion. I think that our question about sacrifice is really pertinent here, obviously. And so um, this is something I want to hear what people think and I will certainly come in uh, to the discussion. It's a big question. It is a very, very big question. And it has brought, shall we say, questions from animal studies right smack dab into the ontology of being that is all of us, right? All of us. And And I think, I mean, I would say yes, the fetus is treated as property. In this case, yes. Okay. But nobody wants to say anything about this. Uh, Lynn, it's good to be difficult. This is why we're doing this. Uh, the discomforting questions, the questions that we do not go to are the ones that need to be addressed. And even if we don't have a reasonable way of answering it, 
just the attempt to begin the conversation together is itself crucial. And so I want, you know, I want to open it, open it up. So let me ask this. This is a question that maybe everyone, sorry, the dog is deciding to throw things, destroying the study. But um, he does not like the question, Lynn, but I do. So we're going to ignore his noise. And um, the, the question here is, again, can, should, and how does the fetus enter into our discussion in terms of capacity, in terms of selfhood, in terms of personhood? And, uh, and I will come in, but I do want to have a little bit more conversation. I don't want to sit here and have a lecture on my hands. Because no, no, I, I can I can jump in a little bit, Colin. Um, I think part of the problem is that um, this debate now uh, has been po polarized into two positions, <laughs> right? And um, one of them is the idea of um, thinking in terms of. Uh, of a series of, of, of property rights around ownership and property rights around the fetus and the body. And, but it's hard to actually argue too hard against that because we live in a society that predicates <laughs> so much of it on property rights. And, um, and then the other position, right? is not about a question of agency or uh, the, the complicated nature of the fetus, because it often comes from a, a, the idea of the fetus as a, as, as a divine from conception, right? And thus carries with it not only a notion of spirit, but a notion of doctrine. And so um, I, I think it's important to have this discussion. And I think it's important actually to, to, to complicate it some too. Thank you. This is Joanne. I, I've been thinking that one way, Paul, I feel that's a beautiful discussion of uh, the two positions in one way that it has become complicated and should be complicated is the ways that uh, disabled activists and folks <laughs> think about these questions, right? Where that, that binary position doesn't hold up very well because of the ways, again, that ableism and assumptions about disability as uh, life not worthy of living and even perhaps not qualifying for personhood um, that, that view of disability actually gets used to support rights for um, reproductive choice for abortion. Um, and, the, and in disability discourse, there tends to be um, talk about abortion as genocide, right? That in that way, the fetus is sort of constructed as human as, as maybe part of that pushback against the ableism that's so connected to um, assumptions about a binary of animality and, 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 and human animals. Um, and, and that is getting, and that, that, um, two, that two sided positions binary is getting further complicated by feminist disability scholars and activists, right? Who want to say we can question society's pressuring of pregnant people towards abortion of presumably disabled fetuses. We can question that, but still support access to those reproductive rights. So there can be, there's, there's a lot of nuance and complexity happening in those um, political, social activist scholarly spaces as well. So that's one of the ways that it's complicated. And I hadn't really thought about through, through the lens of the human and personhood. I really appreciate this question. Ian is prodding us, 
There is a question from Caitlin Palo. How do viruses fit into, viruses fit into or remake divisions between human and animal? I'm thinking here of the narratives of animal markets as the site of viruses mixing together in the ghostly invisibility of the virus. Do communicable diseases tell us something about who is counted as human, what care is, what rights are? Excellent question at this time. I can jump in with that because I've been looking a lot at uh, this mecha idea, mechanisms of lateral DNA transfer, actually how DNA gets passed from species to species and not through generation to generation. And uh, for me, it's really fascinating because it, there's, a, uh, to use a, diff a different word that we, uh, we've heard today, there is a deep biological communion between um, human DNA and viral DNA or between any type of animal DNA and viral DNA. Um, matter of fact, there's a, a, not a it's a significant amount of human DNA actually w is counted at, would, is considered to be coming, coming from a virus, right? So it might even have evolutionary implications. And it kind of works in, I think, two modes. It kind of brings together a sociology and a biology in a way that I think our society wants to keep separate all the time. <laughs> they either want to face the social, right, and look at this as a discourse on rights, or they're looking at this as the biological <laughs> and tend to think about it in too deterministic of terms. And I think what it does, I think, is, is, is again, show us about the different ways a single organism inhabits the world and how it relies on so many different organisms. And if we don't start there, um, I don't think we're gonna be able to make uh, uh, compelling choices about it in society. Thank you. I wanna move back a, a bit to the question again of love. Um, the, the question, um, about love's politics. I, I think we are all thinking through the nature of sentiment, the nature of attachment and affinity. And um, Radhika has mentioned the work of Deborah Thomas on a reparative love that relies on an unflinching, unflinching witnessing of to and reckoning with violence. Um, I was struck um, by Radhika's turn to love in her book, and can, I wonder if you could say a little more, Radhika, about the reparations that a love um, that reckons with violence uh, would allow. Can you elaborate? What kind of reparative, what, you know, what is the reparative for you in that love? What is it, you know, reparative of violence? What, what is the word reparative doing in that sentence? Sure, thank you. Um, let me just say something very quickly. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say, let me just say something very quickly why I think that question of love's politics is also so important. Um, I've been thinking recently a lot about fascist love and thinking with the work of Sarah Ahmed about how central love is to the politics of fascism globally. Uh, I mean, India at the moment, love for Hindu family, Hindu community, the Hindu nation is what animates these really violent projects of expulsion and death. Um, thinking about whether love is lost to us as the basis of a different kind of world is a question that is urgent now. And it's a question that divides many. Um, Colin, you were saying something earlier about Peter Singer and the lack of empathy, right? This idea that you can, that somehow, I, I, I don't like dogs. I don't actually want to engage with flesh and blood. I'm interested in 
the abstract category. And there are some scholars, I'm thinking here of the work of Nesar Gidabe, who suggest that perhaps this is the best way to take an ethical stance, an indifference to difference um, that isn't actually predicated in working through the weeds, but is, um, is removed from the press of actual relationships. And I'm not sure that's the way to go for me and working from my own ethnographic context. I think I'm much more inclined to think about working through the mess of what everyday relationships look like and through of working through the senses, as you were saying, right? Working through touch and taste and, um, and those forms of engagement. So for me, I think the question of repair is one, it, it's the question I pose in the, um, in the box. Does love reinforce a kind of narcissism? Does love make the self feel satisfied and smug? Or does love open up the possibility of questioning what complicity looks like, even if you aren't actually directly complicit in violence? And I think that repair means recognizing um, that, there is, that there is no necessary kind of arc to work to, towards. So the question of what justice or what ethical positions look like is not predetermined but has to be worked through in the context of the everyday through a recognition always of one's um, constant complicity. And I use the word from Deborah Thomas, I think for the ethnographic context I work in, it's particularly stark where the women that I was working with were always thinking through what it meant for them to claim love when they were complicit in these acts of killing, whether it was directly in the case of sacrifice or whether it was through abandoning cows that then ended up near butchers and to think about what it would mean to repair that. So thinking about repair is an ongoing question. I don't know what repair would look like. And I think that's exactly it, to recognize that what repair looks like and who that repair is owed to is an open question. Do you owe it to um, the spirits? Do you owe it to future generations? I write in the book, and maybe this is where I'll stop because this is something that has always stayed with me. I write in the book about um, this one young woman who, um, told me one day that she wanted me to accompany her to this temple dedicated to a god of livestock. And I was surprised because that's usually a temple people only go to if there's a new calf in the family or something like that. And she went there and she lit a little lamp and did this ritual. And when I asked her why she'd done it, she said that she dreamt about this goat that she, her family had raised and she would spend a lot of time with this goat and would take this goat out to graze every winter and would uh, the goat would love to eat rhododendrons. She remembered all these really intimate details about their time together. And she had dreamt of the goat and believed that the goat was asking for a form of repair. So that little moment of marking ritual and marking grief and marking guilt was in that moment, a little act of repair. And so I don't think of repair as something that is a final project. I don't think of it as something that offers satisfaction. It's something that's ongoing. It's an open wound in some sense. Yes. And Thank that to me is, yeah, the film? I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I was gonna say, I'm really glad you added that last part because um, I get a little bit worried when notions of repair are then um, uh, linked with notions of love because of the type of going back that repair often suggests. You repair some type of damage, right? In order to uh, c come to recover some type of whole self. And I just don't think that that ever occurs. I don't think that occurs in medicine. I don't think that occurs with trauma. And so it's the idea of having to work through it and keep going through it though, is much more about a notion of love, not as a projection, uh, into a larger category of groups like uh, uh, Ahmed talks about with white supremacy. I love this, you know, the people would say, I love this conception of white nationalism. Mm -hmm. But it's about opening up yourself to something that you could not have anticipated. And for me, that's really a, a way of holding yourself in the world. In, in the way that you were talking about, Radhika, uh, it, it's something that you do every day. Absolutely. Now, that's the danger. I mean, the notion that love has, in some sense, been uh, robbed of its force by the business of sentiment and romantic love. The question of its violence, the question of the actual, you know, guts and gore 
of uh, the experience of love between people and between animals. And it, I think that of all the things we've discussed that would be really a key to continuing our investigation of the human, I'm sorry to say again, and the non-human are, let us use a word that I still like to use, it's dangerous, I know, but animality, um, to retrieve what is, in a sense, um, a response to the state of injury, pain, and violence in this world, I think that it would be important to take the business of love, its, its uses, where it appears, when it appears, in those most dangerous of places, but also to imagine how, by thinking of replenishing and redeeming, we might, as Radhika said, start from the ground where we walk through the weeds, in the dirt. That is the key. The key to move through daily life, through the quotidian, in all of its uh, debris and unsalvaged spaces, to move through it, uh, to find then a language for that experience of connection and, and affiliation. And so I'm taking a lot of that from the experience of in voodoo ritual, the ways in which the very things that can call the spirits to the earth to re-embody themselves in the human are the things that might seem to deny their coming. There is nothing divine about the things a divine or sacred as we see it in the altar to the gods in voodoo. It's about how the objects become through their being ritually repeated, used in ceremony, they begin to acquire, attain another dimension that joins people together uh, in this exploration. Um, again, I once said that the practice of voodoo had the most um, elegant and far-reaching conception of human identity. And I would now say that actually the experience of voodoo, its very practices can teach us so much about many of the questions we've been raising here about sacrifice, about personhood, and mostly about how we could conceive of a way of discussing a kind of amorous engagement that doesn't need terms like depersonalization or depersonification any longer. It's that kind of a rapprochement with we think, what we think of as non-linguistic cannot be expressed in language. That is where I think we want to begin to speak from that sentience. And um, I'll just end there and say, it has been really terrific. Uh, just talking with you all about these and raising these questions. And I hope, Ian, there'll be a way to preserve the questions. Um, again, I'm not a technological whiz. Is there a way to preserve the chat? Ian, are you there? Well, anyone, does anyone know? Can we preserve these questions on the chat, Nina? Yeah, the questions will all be preserved and um, there's a recording as well of today's session. So we can um, preserve that material and try to uh, publish it alongside the recording. Oh, if you could, because I mean, I think there are questions that some of us would want to return to and especially to people who ask those questions. Certainly, we can circulate um, a transcript of the chat um, amongst all of you too, so you have it for your for your records. Um, thank you, all of you so much. I'm, I'm kind of like in a um, deep space of, um, of wonder with all of these threads that everyone brought together, as well as all the questions that kind of further complicated all the dimensions of your of your thinking and your and your research and um, leaving it on this 
dynamic question of the politics of love um, will certainly, I think, stay with stay with all of us um, for the years to come. Um, I want to just um, take a minute to note that again, that link to the microsite where everyone's uh, contribution, written contributions um, that everyone spoke to today, you can um, read them read them there, as well as find today's recording when it gets posted in a few, a few weeks, as well as the recordings from our two previous sessions, which were equally um, as, as rich. And, and then please keep an eye out for the Henry reopening in the new year when Bam Bitchell's film, um, Bugs and Beasts Before the Law will be on view. Um, and then the artist will be giving a lecture performance in early March um, that uh, further addresses their research and engagement with this fascinating history and legacy of the animal trials. Um, and so again, you can find more dates and sign up for alerts to these future events um, on the microsite and the Henry website. So with that, I think we can um, say thank you again to everyone who participated today, um, panelists as well as audience for your very thoughtful and considered uh, queries. Um, so with that, um, I will leave you all and uh, express another um, bit of gratitude. Thank Take you. care. Thank Bye. you so much.